Global warming has melted the glaciers, flooding the entire surface of the earth. Survivors are forced to live in floating cities in the middle of the ocean. But what threats lurk beneath the water? Junk City is a floating city with a population of only 72 people. There are sentries on duty, vigilantly looking out for potential threats. One of them suddenly notices something among the waves and asks for his partner's binoculars. Seeing a massive flock of approaching fins, the sentry orders his colleagues to leave and starts sounding the alarm himself. The loud sound of the bell makes the man an easy bait for predators, and even the fact that he is on the tower is no barrier to them. In the highest jump, one of the sharks grabs the poor man with its wide open mouth and disappears under the water with him. Panic ensues in the city. People run and fuss while the predators devour the inhabitants one by one, stopping at nothing. Destruction and chaos reign all around. Meanwhile, a heroine named B is helped to hide in a wooden barrel, and a shark immediately grabs the man who saved her. Cautiously peeking out from her temporary hiding place, the girl watches as the rest of her tribesmen are devoured. We are then transported to a larger town called Redeemer, with a population of 436. The local sentry on the radio reports that he sees a light signal from Junk City. The operator tries to contact Junk City, but the savior sentry clarifies that the town appears to have disappeared altogether. Then they decide to send an experienced sea wolf named Dylan Barrick to investigate the town's situation. Next, we find ourselves at the Western Ocean Research Station. A scientist named Dr. Shaw contacts Barrick and orders him to get a move on, as the team is already itching to attach some scrubbers to the rocket. Pushing the throttle on his speedboat, he quickly heads toward Junk City. Another scientist named Dr. Nichols reports to Shaw that the rocket is almost ready and the weather conditions are perfect for launch. But they are missing some components to complete the experiment, and even if everything succeeds as it should, there are only enough scrubbers for one shot. Nichols explains that the ambient temperature is increasing every day, and the faster they send the scrubbers into the atmosphere, the better chance they have of reversing the warming dynamics. And they only have one chance. Dr. Shaw gives the team 48 hours to complete the mission. A helicopter is also dispatched to help Junk City from the rescue, whose pilot outruns the boat and immediately reports on the surviving girl on the dock of the ruined town. After B climbs out of the barrel, sharks immediately chase her, but a boat approaches in time to save her life at the last moment. A pack of sharks also chases the boat, but it manages to escape. Barrick shares fresh water with the girl but asks her not to get carried away because it is of great value nowadays. Meanwhile, a pilot named Nathan returns to Savior and tells of hordes of giant sharks, led by one particularly colossal specimen. Barrick brings B to the Western Station, but she is afraid to leave the boat. He tells his guests that in today's world, it is the safest place on Earth. According to him, it survived the world's flood, and they have many missiles at its disposal. But the girl argues that rockets won't help them against sharks. Suddenly Dr. Nichols and Dr. Shaw show up on the boat. They say that B does not need to leave the boat because they will go together to the Savior, which has promised them supplies of iridium for electrical contacts. They also want to talk to the rescued girl on the Savior. Left alone with B, Dr. Shaw shows her a giant rocket to which they will attach a particular device called CO2 scrubbers. The CO2 is causing the poles to melt, so the entire planet is covered in water. So their team created a device that could be attached to the rocket and launched into the atmosphere. And if everything goes according to plan, the warming can be stopped. Dr. Shaw stresses that the best minds are working on the project, but any help is welcome. Along the way, Dr. Nichols shows Barrick the sensor to attach to the shark. Barrick replies that they should do this kind of thing without him. He adds that after the shark he saw in junk, he has not the slightest desire to go near them. At the meeting, Dr. Nichols tries to explain the situation. As the ocean heats up daily, its organisms gradually die out. Sharks are at the top of the food chain, and when they have nothing to eat, they have to look for food on the surface. And here, humans are the main food. And the dying ocean will try to take them with it. For his part, Barrick shows scientists radar photos that have survived Junk City. Dr. Nichols exclaims that she has never seen so many sharks in one place. And when asked what the massive specimen in the center is, Barrick suggests that perhaps they are dealing with some mutated alpha female, the mother of all sharks. And presumably, this pack is headed toward the savior. After arriving at the savior, the heroes try to tell the local leaders of the impending threat. They do not believe that sharks can be so organized and dangerous. Especially where are they to go, not to evacuate to Western? Shaw stresses that the science station is not designed for so many people, so they need to strengthen the savior's defenses. The locals realize they don't have time for this, so they prepare to give the sharks a fight. The inhabitants of Savior begin a ritual battle dance that attracts the sharks. The predators swim to the pier, and the warriors bravely pierce them with their spears. Hoping for a great catch, they lower a special powerful hook into the water. The Alpha immediately swallows and drags it to the bottom, breaking the tower. At this time, the city begins to attack the other sharks, 
and everyone decides to get out of there quickly. Since their boat is far away from the pier, Barak heroically decides to swim to it. On the way, he is chased by one of the sharks, but Dr. Nichols gets its attention by hitting the dock with an oar. Meanwhile, the warriors continue to fight the sharks heroically, but the city's defenses fail, collapsing and exploding. As they get closer to the boat, Barak discovers that his vessel is about to be stolen. A fierce fight breaks out between him and the thief, during which his adversary hangs over the side. At that moment, a shark jumps out and bites his head off on the fly. The other characters also decide not to wait and get to the boat by swimming. The savior's cameraman joins them, taking the iridium case with him. They climb safely aboard and continue to fight off the sharks. Once thriving, they leave the nearly destroyed city. Along the way, Dr. Nichols suggests it's all about the alpha female, who can control the other sharks with electromagnetic waves and bioimpulses. Dr. Shaw agrees with his colleague and suggests that the phenomenon could be used against themselves. Then Barak notices they are being chased by a massive army of sharks, led by an alpha female. He asks Nichols to hold the helm and goes down to the hold to give them some speed. Dr. Shaw contacts the station and orders him to hurry up with the preparations for the operation, for the iridium is on its way. She then explains her insane plan of action to those present. According to Shaw, there is a dormant underwater volcano nearby, and they have a device, the splitting of which will help wake up that volcano. They've also developed a sensor that simulates an overturned boat with people on it. This will help attract sharks directly to the volcano. Some team members are skeptical about the plan, especially the possible delivery of these devices and sensors. But Shaw recalls that they have a pilot, Nathan, to help them. After receiving the necessary instructions and devices from Shaw, Nathan sets off on a critical mission. While trying to fly close to the pack, he lowers the plane too low, and one of the sharks jumps out and sinks its teeth into it. The aircraft unexpectedly crashes, and the shark devours Nathan himself. The important sensor is left floating on the surface. The heroes are upset and begin to consider plan B. Barrick says he can theoretically speed up his boat to 30 knots. That way, they might be able to launch the sensor and escape the explosion in time. The plucky Nichols decides not to risk the crew and uses maneuverable kite surfing to install the sensor. Gliding through the waves, she easily evades the sharks and grabs the device on the surface. Dr. Shaw contacts the station and orders them to be on standby. The scientists start the necessary processes and set the unit in motion. In doing so, they agree that they need to leave the station and launch the rocket remotely. After all, they don't know how the huge launcher will behave in terms of the scale of radiation. Meanwhile, Nichols drops a device in the right place, which, in turn, unfolds and plunges the necessary sensor to depth. Shaw contacts Western again and reports that the device is in position. Her team members report that everything is ready for launch. Shaw orders the launch and counts down. The rig is activated, and a huge electric beam is launched into the sky. Everyone cautiously cheers and watches. The beam bounces off the atmosphere and returns toward a pre-installed sensor on the bottom. A staff member informs them that they are now no longer allowed to remain connected to the power. While trying to pull the plug, she is thrown back and passes out. A beam from the sky does its job and wakes up a dormant volcano, the eruption of which begins to destroy all the sharks in the vicinity. Dr. Nichols, in his kite surf, heroically escapes to the safe zone from the explosion. And while everyone on the kite board is waiting for her arrival, a colossal wave rises from the volcano's eruption. Barak tries to speed up and evade the impending tsunami. Somehow they still manage to ride the enormous wave and avoid crashing. Meanwhile, Nichols is still gliding through the waves on her board, but the same alpha chases her. A spectacular chase ensues, and Nichols performs a series of spectacular jumps in an attempt to dodge the beast. During one of these stunts, the shark knocks the board out from under the girl's feet, and she falls. Into the water, a speedboat appears just in time to save Nichols from the pursuit. At the last moment, the shark still tries to grab the girl, but Shaw thrusts a spear into the predator, thus setting a beacon on her. Meanwhile, all is quiet on Vestrin, and the unconscious scientist is already okay. At this point, Barrack's runabout finally returns to the station and brings back the iridium needed to launch the rocket. The scientists report that they don't have enough power to launch, and it will take two or three days to fix the equipment. But they don't have time because the pumps that pump out the water and keep the Vestrin afloat have been damaged. The station is sinking little by little, and it is advisable to launch the rocket before it sinks. While the team is thinking about where to get the energy to launch, Dr. Shaw reports that a sensor installed on the shark shows curious readings. The Alpha uses its powerful electromagnetic organ to control the other sharks, and if its code is deciphered, it can get a huge energy source. At this time, a pack of sharks, led by the Alpha, are approaching Vestrin. The team urgently prepares to carry out their plan and scatters into position. Barrett clarifies how they are going to control the Alpha after all. Nichols explains that it is not necessary to control it. The main thing is to simulate the signal and send it to the others. The team members finish preparing iridium, scrubbers, and other things necessary to launch the rocket. 
but the sharks begin to attack the station en masse. Defending B from one of them, the charming operator Savior heroically dies. At this time, Nichols manages to intercept the Alpha's signal, and Shaw traps her, thus getting the power to set up the rocket launch. Suddenly an automatic countdown begins, and the rocket still manages to take off. But, on launch, the shark falls into the water with Shaw, and the Predator devours the scientist in cold blood. An enraged Nichols uses the signal to get the other sharks to attack the Alpha. At first, this is what happens, but after coping with his fellows, the Alpha decides to take revenge on the humans and attacks the boat. During the attack, the shark gets stuck in the cabin. The barely surviving Barrack steers the boat toward Western and jumps into the water with Nichols. The boat crashes into the station at high speed and explodes with the Alpha. Barrack and Nichols swim safely to the pier, where B and the remaining crew members greet them. They offer to leave the station quickly before it sinks. Six months later, our heroes are on a boat and notice that the top of the Statue of Liberty and the peaks of New York skyscrapers are visible from the water. They look at each other cheerfully because the water is gradually receding.